Um, as you're probably aware, this is a national forum um, funded um, presentation. It's part of their national seminar series that's been on, I think, since October, running through till May or June. And uh, so we're very grateful for the forum, um, for their funding for this. And also, um, it will be recorded. The three sessions will be recorded and will be shared with the forum. And they will probably put it up on their website, just so you're aware of that, because you might be featured in it. <laughs> um, so we have teas and coffees here. There'll be a fresh coffee coming along a little bit later. And then we've lunch. Very nice lunch at one o'clock, okay, up in C404, which we'll bring you up there. It's quite close to here. Um, so as I said, we have three sessions today. So the first one, they're all on assessment, primarily on formative assessment. And we're um, in the first one, we're looking at co-teaching. Second one, we're looking at using educational technology to formatively assess in a large class setting. And the third one, then, we're looking at um, assessments in a small class and in a large class and how to um, spiral assessments used in one um, setting through to a different context, a different teaching and learning context. So that's kind of the arc of what we're looking at today. It's not going to be too formal, so please stop us, ask questions. Um, you know, we're a small group, so it's, it's very easy to do that. So please do stop and ask if we're not clear or whatever. Um, so myself and Anna, I suppose, will kick off, and um, we, uh, as, as you're aware, the three of us, myself, Fiona, and Anna, work in the special education department. So uh, most of our work is uh, around uh, inclusion, special education and needs, and so on, across a range of different programmes. What we're focusing on here today, the three of us, uh, is the work that we do with our undergraduate B.Ed. students. Okay, so that's the group we're looking at. Um, so the first session we're looking at using co-teaching um, as a, a tool for formative assessment and to allow us to run a workshop-based approach for 400 students um, in, the, in a large theatre. Um, so in this session, as well, what we look at first is the context and why we went down that route a couple of years ago with this particular group. Um, and we're going to, a lot of what we're talking about today across the three sessions is we're coming at it today from a very practice-based um, starting point. Um, the first session this morning on co-teaching and the third one is also a research-based um, uh, project. So we have two projects going at the moment um, in terms of research, researching our own practice. So we're not going to focus massively on that element of it today. We might touch on it, but we're more looking at the practice base of what we actually did. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit in terms of co-teaching around student learning and the impact on our own teaching then, how it, in, how it has influenced or evolved, I suppose, over the last few years um, and, and changed maybe in some ways or certainly expanded what, what we're doing. So I suppose to give you the basic context, first of all, uh, what we're still calling the new four-year B.Ed. So in, in 2012, the first group of students came into the college in, in September or October 2012 as the, the new first years on a new four-year B.Ed. programme. So we had changed from a three-year to a four-year B.Ed. And the entire programme was rewritten. And it changed. It had an impact on everyone. It had an impact particularly on our department. Like, for example, in total, we went from one module to eight um, on that program. Um, and also, there are other aspects of our work on that program in terms of permeating um, inclusion, differentiation, and so on across the program as well. So it actually had a big impact on, on our access to that group of students and how we were teaching them. And I suppose the other big thing was that we had always, up until that, on the old B.Ed., taught that group at the, um, we had taught that group in the final semester of third year. So we saw them just before they went out the door. And um, we were given an opportunity then to um, work with this group in first year. And in, and in that first year, in 2012, we had them the first day they came into the college. So they, they came straight in. I think it was 10 a.m. on Tuesday morning of the first week of lectures, we had that group. So to be honest, as somebody teaching, as, as, as the teacher of that group, I had no, or certainly very little sense of 
um, where a group of students might be at who had just come in. Um, I was very used to teaching final year, final semester students at the other end who had done the whole course, completed all their school placements and so on, and I knew what knowledge they had from the programme, whereas this group didn't have a knowledge from the programme because they'd just come in the door. Um, so um, that was one consideration and, and it was one that kind of we thought about a lot when we were planning the module. Um, we cut out a lot of stuff that we would have done with our final year students. We slowed down a lot of other stuff and, 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 and so on. So it had it, obviously we considered it when we were writing that module. Um, so we had them the first semester um, and I knew from teaching the groups of 400 already that um, there is a reluctance to um, speak if you ask a question it is quite difficult to get someone who's happy or lots of people who are happy to put their hands up and answer it, it, it's quite for our students it's quite daunting um, and they don't like it so now I'm not of the belief that if, if students aren't talking they're not participating I think if somebody is eagerly listening to you they're participating but that's only one way so in that first year in terms of um, how we were teaching the programme, I, I wanted to kind of get in early enough in, in maybe in expanding some of the things we were doing or thinking about that, particularly with first years who were just straight in the door, um, and how we might get the student voice, which mo may not necessarily be oral, that we could find it in a different way. Um, as I said, they didn't have, they hadn't been in the classroom as a teacher, they hadn't been on school placement, we were going to be looking at, and I'll go into some of the threshold concepts in a minute, but things like teaching, assessment, how you adapt to that, how you differentiate that, and they hadn't done teaching, they hadn't done assessment. So, so uh, and normally, when you would be teaching about that, you would be making very explicit links to what they've already learned, um, and, and trying to tie that in for them. Whereas this time, we were still doing that, but a lot was, you're going to hear about this or when you go out to classes next semester keep an eye out for this or whatever um, and then um, we in terms of getting their voice as well um, I had I, I continue to use a couple of strategies that I'd used with the big classes before using you know setting a question and which isn't a knowledge-based question like what do you believe inclusion to be or what does the term special education and needs mean to you like give everyone a post-it and we take those and, and type it up and feed it back to the students so, so they get an idea. So it, that was one way in one or two sessions that where, where bigger ideas um, were garnered for the, from them. Um, for this, I, I knew we were going to look at diagnostic assessment. And you have to do it. Yeah, to understand what diagnostic assessment is, you have to, it, there has to be a hands-on activity. So in that first year, um, I decided to, on my own, to give them some um, workshop-based activities. And it worked kind of okay, but it was just me um, trying to get around everybody and pull it together or whatever. And then it evolved to extending to the possibility of, of, of it being much more workshoppy, much more supported by others. Um, and. Um, I approached Anna and asked her would she co-teach with me um, and uh, then also and we hadn't thought about it at the beginning I'd like to say we had thought about it but we hadn't we're in as teacher educators and as third level teachers in the context of third level teachers we're in quite a unique position that the very strategies skills and um, behaviors that we exhibit are hopefully the skills, strategies and behaviours you want the teachers, those students teachers, to exhibit when they're out in schools. So they are learning from what we're doing and what we're saying. So if we are saying theoretically um, you need to collaborate, learning support and class teachers need to collaborate, that there needs to be collaboration you know, between special needs assistants and so on and lots of other things outside of inclusion and special needs. We need they need to see that and see how that's done and we didn't think about that when we started off in this but that was that evolved that it became very evident that Anna and I were co-teaching 
and using workshops, providing formative assessment and feedback. And even at that, we're not explicit even now with the formative assessment bit. We're very explicit about the co-teaching, so we actually name it now and we say, this is what we're doing. Uh, this is why we're doing it and we name it and then try and get them to think about it in a classroom, in a school situation. So, but that evolved, that didn't, that wasn't something we thought about um, when we started doing it. Just, Andrew, just to add on that, after the co-taught workshops on the timetable, as anne said, we didn't think about it at the outset, I was going to be do, delivering three lectures which related specifically to collaboration, to teachers and SNAs working together, and specifically to co-teaching. Now, bear in mind, the first time we rolled this out, as Anne-Marie has said, none of these first year, first semester students had been in schools at all. Their visits didn't happen to the second semester. So I was going to be talking about something that potentially, now maybe as part of the apprenticeship of observation in the classroom, they may have seen some co-teaching going on, but um, we were aware that, that, that they potentially hadn't. So again, this was an opportunity then for me, they had observed us co-teaching over that series of workshops, and then I was going to be going in and explicitly talking about co-teaching, about the challenges, the opportunities it presented and so on. So at that point, they were going to have something to draw on. Yeah. And it was, yes, and it, was, it just meant that that link could be explicitly made again, and it gave them something more than just the theoretical ideas that they could, we could actually refer back, or that Anna could refer back to what we were doing and what was challenging, what wasn't, and so on. Um, so anyway, so in summary, what we, what we did was, um, in 2013-14, so um, we set this up as a research project, researching our own teaching um, under the CREATE umbrella, which is a, um, a research, a large research project here in St. Pat's, researching teaching um, with uh, initial teacher education programmes. So, so there are a lot of people um, uh, who have research projects, and all of them, pretty much looking at their own work as uh, in terms of teaching, learning, assessment and so on, as opposed to their field of study. It, we're looking at our, 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 um, our own practice. So in 2013-14, we, we went from, well, I had started on my own just with two workshops, I think. We extended it to three with m myself and Anna. Um, we gave, and we'll show you this in a minute, they, we divided the room of 400 uh, into four groups, I think it was, and they looked, um, in one of the workshops, for example, they each looked at a piece of that child's work, four different pieces of that child's work, and, and then we fed it back. So, um, and we, we um, reviewed what the students thought, um, and then the following year, we extended it out to four workshops, and that's currently what we're intending to do again this year. Again, looking at the same threshold concepts, and, um, but we felt that the, the, one of the threshold concepts is quite complex. Like on, on our special ed course and our postgrad course, they would look at this every day for three weeks full time. You know, so we're doing it in a couple of sessions just to give them an idea. Um, and again, we would feed back. Uh, as part of the research project in year two, um, we were observed by uh, one of our own colleagues in the department and by um, somebody outside of the department who had teaching and learning experience. Sessions were video recorded and we analyzed those. And we show you a couple of clips of those in a minute and so on. And again, we asked the students their opinion. So, that's, so we're in the middle. We haven't written anything yet, Anna, sure we haven't. We've, we've just, we've gathered all the data and we've got it all. So we, we have to do the hard bit now and actually put it together into some sort of a paper. But so, so that's where we're at um, with this. So, so it evolved um, over and it was part, but the, I suppose the most important thing is that it, it, it stemmed from a, a perceived need that we, for us to formatively assess this particular group of students, A, and B, to get their voice in some way. Um, so, um, Anna, do you want to, yeah. And, and just to reiterate before we, we, we move on to that, to get their voice and bearing in mind that we had not previously worked with 
first year beginning of the program um, cohort. So it was really crucial. Whereas, as Anne-Marie said, Anne-Marie has a very good handle. Those of us working with the third year group, the final year students, were pretty clear on, on their level of understanding of the concepts. But with the first years, we were in a bit of unknown territory there. Okay, so we're going to try and illustrate um, the co-taught workshops. Just flag for you some of the threshold concepts that, that, that we, we were, were faced with, um, that our students were faced with, I suppose I should really say. Uh, I highlight those first of all, and then give you some kind of a flavour of the tasks that the students were completing. And we'll show you some examples of those on the visualizer and show you some video, video clips as well. So we were thinking about the session here and thinking about the threshold concepts, the challenging gateway sort of ideas that the students would really have to get to grips with. These very, uh, you know, uh, these first year students in the second semester. I suppose the threshold concepts emerge from education theory more generally, but specifically focusing on special and inclusive education. So I suppose it would be fair to say that one of the key conceptual um, models, uh, it hallmarks, I suppose, of special education would be an individualized approach to planning and assessment. Now, remember, these students had very little input on planning and assessment for a whole class. So, and we were going to be talking about the need for an individualized approach to planning and assessment. So we knew that was going to be, as Amory said, a, a challenging um, ask of them. Um, we were focusing on diagnostic assessment, and by that, um, I suppose we're talking about using assessment materials, um, the, the children's, the young people's work, and using that to identify patterns of strength and patterns of of, of needs, patterns of difficulties. And again, uh, this was building on a, a relatively low level of knowledge with these first year students. And then the third, I suppose, key concept that would be very much associated with special and inclusive education that we really wanted to, um, to, to our students to, to begin to develop some understanding of was the idea, and it's building on the individualized approach to planning and assessment, writing individual learning targets. targets. Targets that were specific, that were challenging, and that were achievable. And we know from our work right across uh, postgraduate programs that this is something that very experienced teachers were finding, were gonna find difficult. So we were aware that these, um, these first years were certainly, it was going to be something that was new to them. So um, to, in order to, to support the students in coming to grips with these ideas, an individual approach to planning and assessment, identifying patterns of strengths and needs and writing targets, we began by giving them, in the first instance, four uh, assessment materials. And Marie, you're gonna show some of these here. They were bearing in mind, first year students, very little input on literacy, teaching and learning. Um, but we focused in on assessment. And we gave them, sorry, Emily, we're going to go. No, just, the first session, which we're not concentrating on the the first session we actually looked at the profile yes. of, um, of, of a child and worked out how you would get more information. Who would you go to? Where would you find the information? What more information do you need? What is this profile telling me? But what's it not telling me? As a teacher, what, might I, what else might I need to know? So that first workshop, work, they worked their way through that um, with the profile. And then we moved to, uh, we now do two of these diagnostic assessment um, sessions. And again, that individual profile session also allowed us to flag up the need for going to other people, the need for collaboration, the need to, to, to get information from others. So this is just a phonics assessment, um, and obviously, you know, indicating the, the words that the child was able to read, and then the nature of the diagnostic assessment is illustrated by the errors, what the child says. So for the word led, the child says len. So that's the diagnostic information that we were going to ask the students to analyze and see if they could establish patterns of strength and areas where there were challenges. Okay. And if they could see patterns to those errors, like you, you'll see a pattern there yourself in terms of vowel sounds. There's a, there's a fairly consistent pattern there of error around vowel sounds, which is knocking this child from reading a number of words because he's just not got the, the vowel sounds um, clear. 
Now we could have chosen any area, I suppose, of any core curriculum area in terms of looking at this, but I suppose we thought that literacy was probably going to be the most accessible and they'd had a little yeah. bit of input on literacy, but not a great deal. In the first two years, yeah. they hadn't had any. Yeah. In the second, in 2013, 14, our module was moved from semester one to semester two. Uh, so they had a wee bit, they'd half a year that, ha that had a semester of yeah. modules before that. Um, they'd had their early childhood module as well, um, which is very helpful. So that was one. There was a phonics assessment. There was um, a spelling assessment. So in the spelling assessment, you have the test word that the child was given and then his response. And the first three of them have been analysed for the students. And they're looking now to see, can they analyze the errors? Is there a pattern? Or does it appear quite bizarre? Um, is it something that we can't work out? We don't have enough evidence here to see a pattern and so on. And they're doing this in pairs. So they're chatting to each other. They're work, they, so if they wish to work alone, they can. If they work, wish to work in pairs or a group of three, they can, okay? It's the thinking we want them to focus on. And I suppose, you know, this is, this was going to be challenging um, and bear in mind that this was the full cohort of 400 students. So that was the spelling assessment. There was also a writing sample where we gave one of the four groups um, a now, sample cause... of the child's writing and again asked them to do the same thing yeah. to identify patterns of strength. So, I mean, obviously you might see a, an initial strength, a very obvious one is the spaces between words, and they might be a little bit big, but the clear uh, demarcation between words. Um, and then on the second line, just he, come down there, isn't it, Anne-Marie? Um, the, the failure to use a capital letter for I, for example. So again, that was quite challenging, but that was a third uh, assessment task. So the phonics, the spelling, the writing sample, and then the fourth one was sight words, wasn't it? Yeah, actually, sight we, the sight words is what we showed you just now. This is the spelling test. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Okay, so the, the, the word the child the is asked it, to yeah. spell, the word cut, and this is what he wrote, C-A-R-H, yeah. again. You'll see words of this, pen, and the child wrote pin, yet, and the child wrote get, okay. and so on. So, so they were our four main groups that we've used. And they were color coded, as you can see them there, as we put them up in the, on the, um, the visualizer, because we had four groups. It was a very large group, and we had to think of everything that would make this fairly manageable. Um, so as they came into the hall, we were literally giving them different materials depending on where they were sitting in the room. Yeah. Okay. And as, as we worked our way through those, um, what was one session, and now we have, a, we have two, we actually use six assessments now, and we've slowed it down to, uh, and we're doing, we do it across two sessions. As the students are feeding back, when they've talked to each other and when they've written, when they've, they've got the materials in their hands and they're analysing writing, at that point, some of them are more willing to speak aloud because they've got, they know what everyone else around them is thinking. Some of them still aren't, but they are very willing to hand you what they wrote and we speak it for them. Or, and as the students are feeding back to us, or if one of us is walking around gathering what they've written, the other one of us is down below typing it. So we're putting it up on the screen to show them, okay, this is what you're saying. This is the pattern you're seeing here. Those of you who are looking at his sight words, listen to what the spelling group is saying. Can you see, and now can you make links? If we look at this child's writing, reading, spelling, can we, his phonics assessment, can we now see even stronger patterns than were there already? Um, so, um, so, and those, that is now two sessions. Um, we feedback, as I said, during the session. So most of the heavy feedback on the diagnostic assessment is during that session. Yeah. And in addition, we're using the loop page to uh, upload collated feedback to the group, okay? So this is, um, I suppose, our analysis of each of those assessments. So the first one is the, the phonics assessment, so on. And here are all the elements and the, the, our analysis of our, I suppose, our um, quantitative and our qualitative analysis of the errors that the child has made and on each of those assessments. So they're getting it live feedback 
on their attempts to diagnostically assess and then it's also made available to them on uh, on loop and we put this up, feedback up as Amory and Anna's um, diagnostic assessment of John John's assessments tests so we put it up as ours so we pull together and then we add maybe the bits they've missed or we've we put in a little more detail and we try and pull it together for them and then we bring they either download or we bring this page with us to the next uh, workshop um, because from here they hop on then to the targets okay um, and I suppose to sort of to, to step back from that a little bit as well yes we will we put up the targets one now in a minute and yeah. um, that again we were aware that they didn't have as much foundational knowledge as it was going to be challenging and we were also aware coming back to our formative and summative assessment that in the the exam or the module at the end of semester they were going to be doing a task very similar to this so we had to be we, we knew that it was going to be challenging so this is why we needed to be really explicit in teasing out their understanding of the concepts in the session responding to that from one session to the next across the four sessions and also providing that uh, feedback on loop uh, as a group and, and uh, everything in our module links directly to the assessment yeah. they, they can see how it links this is probably the most explicit yeah. in that we actually take them because it's application of knowledge and it's application of knowledge in the context of not having assessment you know bigger picture stuff that our third years used to have um, so we're, we're taking them and, and we're very explicitly taking them step by step by step through these threshold concepts that then we want to see them apply in the summit of assessment at the end of the year and then fourth of the four co-taught uh, workshops with regard to individual planning and assessment was you know again another really difficult task the uh, task was for them to write specific measurable smart learning targets so um, we'll show you video clips in a minute um, but uh, again, Anne-Marie said, we asked them to write the targets, we gave them examples of the targets, we asked them to draft targets, to give us, hand us, um, because again, coming back to Anne-Marie's point, they don't want to. They're afraid. It's a challenging task. They're in a group of 400 for a multiplicity of reasons they don't want to verbalise, but they would hand one of us their targets and then we were able to share them with the group. But uh, this was a really challenging task for them. And remember, they hadn't been in schools. They hadn't been asked to plan for working with learners. So again, you can see here, we obviously gave them lots of examples, but then uh, we took targets live in the session with them. And then again, we did the same. We uploaded their targets um, to Loop with our formative So we feedback, feedback on, on every that. target. And, and um, I, I suppose the, way it, the other thing that has evolved since last, last year was we, we took the hardest, I think, what we perceived to be the hardest of the diagnostic assessment. We gave one group an oral language transcript to analyse, which is actually quite difficult, even though they've done it in early childhood with a young child, it's still hard. Um, and we took that in the final workshop and we modelled how to write the learning targets and where we were getting the targets from. So we had our analysis of John's oral language transcript and then we explained how we came to write, to decide what John needed to learn and how we would word that. I'm incredibly interested in, in what you're doing. I think uh, where you are pulling everything in context from the very start is actually much better than the old way, if we were to because um, the students not have to wait until towards your Correct. context. Correct. Correct. That was the big learning yeah. for us because like we wouldn't have done it if we thought they would fail it, that they wouldn't be able to do it. But I was a bit worried about it because of their the, the difficult concepts that we want them to work with. But my anecdotal perception is that it has served them really, really, really well to hear this the day they walk into St. Yeah. Pat's and not the day they're walking out. Yeah. And they have, I think, some won't carry it, they'll forget it. 
but the vast majority of America's big ideas that well, looking at that, that's and, yes. you want a group of her, and, but, but to be honest, we'll get to the summit a bit in a minute. But we've been bowled over yeah. by their ability. Now we get the range um, in the summit assessment, and some people who have paid attention, some people who clearly weren't at a workshop or so didn't, didn't log on to. We put everything on loop. So even if you miss the workshop, okay, it's going to be a bit harder because you have to do the work independently. Everything's up there. Yeah. All of our feedback on everything is up there. So if you've read that, even if you miss the workshops, you'll still learn it. Um, and most do. Yeah. They're really, they've been really good. But really you, good. you've really highlighted a key point there, Mark. I mean, we had taught final semester students, we were well used to that, and these first years, and if, you know, philosophically within the department, we, we felt, and in fact, in feedback from students who had only had their input on special education as they were going out the door, the feedback from them was, you know, we need to have this from the beginning. And actually, as our head of department has reminded us, it gives us a real opportunity to win their hearts and minds in the sense that, you know, special education, inclusive education is not an add on, something that you learn about as you're going out the door, but rather something that needs to be fundamental to your developing sense of yourself as a beginning teacher from the very beginning. And it's before they're coming in contact with students. Yes. And actually, because the school placement has changed on the RBI programme as well, so on semester two, in semester two they go out every Friday and then they do a week in June in the same classroom. And it's very well structured and they have certain things to look at and observations and that. But I think my, my perception, I could be wrong, and maybe some of you who are going out and on those school placement visits might know better than me, but um, my perception is that they're bringing some of the ideas into the class. They're going in with that in their head. They can't help. Yeah. I hope so. Anyway, yeah. The other thing is, you know, bear in mind, I mean, I don't know, there's several pages of those learning targets. So it looks really onerous in terms of our workload. But we have to be honest and say that the real bulk of the work in terms of those that feedback on their attempts at writing targets, on their diagnostic assessment, the heavy lifting on that happened in the first year. The first and year after that, I mean, we're right getting up. the same um, material from the students, so we're able to add, maybe highlight particular things, but the bulk of the work the heavy happened work in the first year. Yeah. I'd like just to concur with Mark uh, around my admiration for what you're doing. Um, I think it's really difficult work. It's much more difficult to do that than, 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 than lecture. But one of the things when I try to do, not exactly like you're doing, but other kinds of work like this, is that it slowed me down a lot. And there was a real tension in my work between what I could actually do with the students and what I could do really well with the students. So it was the old tension between content coverage and learning. And one of the things it forced me to do, and I just would, would, would like your comments on this, is the extent to which you got the priorities of what you wanted to do right from the beginning. So I suspect that you just didn't get the same amount of stuff done. And then you probably had to make some decisions about what was really important, I imagine. We made those decisions when we rewrote what we were doing at, at, back in 2011, when we had to rewrite the modules and, rewrite, and write new modules and work out if we, we knew we were going to have people in first year. And we knew we'd have them in fourth year. And we knew kind of the, the frame of this. So yeah, we prioritized what could and should. We made decisions. And there are lots of things we're not doing mm. in this module. But that decision was made in our planning. It, it, it wasn't retrospective when we started teaching. The teaching approaches and doing workshops like this were made to fit what to, ha to see how best we could hit the learning outcomes we had already prioritised. And this is just one way, one set of, one approach. Um, and we don't do this for the whole module, obviously. But we're, I'm tr we're trying to extend the formative assessment approaches in other aspects of that same module as well. But no, those decisions were made in the planning stages when we were planning what we thought the students needed to learn in year one, knowing what was coming generally in year two, three, and four. And there are gaps. And I suppose, but I suppose, in response to that, as Anne-Marie said, those decisions about 
what we just had to forget about doing were made initially. But I know uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, as we were planning the sessions, um, we, be, we, we were realizing, okay, now we're actually gonna slow this down within the session. The concepts were there, but even in terms of you know, how many learning targets we might ask them to try and write and so on, uh, that certainly probably we had to kind of slow down the pace, but the concepts were the same. And that's, yes, that's modified and changed, as has some of the other work on some of the other sessions that we do as well, as you... Yeah, can I say that, that I think that message is a very important message, um, and, and I think that people have been through that experience that you've been through, it would be really important to communicate that. If you, if you do, are writing this up, I think it, my sense is that this is quite a common experience. Yeah. It's to feel quite frustrated by the fact that you're slowing down you're not getting as much done. But the payoff should be in better learning, better teaching and learning. And I think the, one of the implications of formative assessment done really well in all kinds of classrooms, same in, in, in currency, is that there tends to be, everything slows down. And that is really a tension for a lot of people. And there's all kinds of pressures on people to do more, to cover the book, cover the content, cover the course. So I think that's a, that's a message that, you know, that it's a, it's, it's a very important message that people communicate that. And I think, yeah. you know, they're through this. So. It, it would be very interesting to, I mean, because I've been in classes, let's say, for example, teaching uh, fourth years and, and, and fifth years. Did you not learn this stuff in first year? You know, <coughs> that, and everybody's had that because we went through the coverage versus yeah. understanding argument. Mm -hmm. And hopefully that won't materialize in this yeah. basis. Now, you are felt with that tension of, am I dumbing down the course because I'm only covering uh, or only, only uh, uh, meeting these learning outcomes, but I, mm. I think it's... I think for crucial. this module, in this context, yeah. it's spot on. Looking across the four years, my perception is there are gaps. But they're fillable and we can work on those. Um, build, a building on a strong foundation yes. as opposed to building something on sand. Yes. And, and I suppose if you step back and look at it philosophically as well, that, you know, that tension that Mike has identified between covering curriculum and student learning is absolutely at the heart of what we in our department are really passionate about. You know, that we need, again, and Marie mentioned the opportunity to model co-teaching, but we hopefully, and I'm really just thinking on my feet as these points have been raised here, that actually if we show a real focus on student learning above all else rather than covering the curriculum, that again is modeling something that is a key f underlying principle that we want those students to carry out there into their work in schools and classrooms. Can I ask a question about that process then? Because this would have been a bit of a shock to the student system, I imagine, because they asked to focus on the process by which they were being taught and role modeled to do as opposed to the content. Did you have to keep reminding them that you were role modeling? We or did they kind of get it at the outset? I think one of our peer observers had suggested to us that we we would do that, and I think probably we, we, we haven't mentioned that, but we had we had as part of the research project we had some peer observers, and that was a suggestion, um, and we I think we have become more and more explicit about that. But what was really fascinating was that even in the first year, when we weren't, when I certainly, when I went in to talk to them about co-teaching, I hadn't been explicit, we hadn't been explicit about what we were actually doing. And I then asked the students for their feedback. Almost intuitively, they could give us feedback on what was challenging and what was beneficial for their learning, what was challenging, what they perceived as challenging, intuitively, but definitely, I think, you know, that idea of kind of explicitly highlighting those key principles is something mm. that we do more and more of as we Yeah, no, we weren't explicit and no. we're going to be much more explicit. Even around the formative assessment, we haven't been explicit at all. I had my first year BEDS uh, on Tuesday and I used Kahoot, which is the next session, for the first time. And this time I said, I am using this so that I can formatively get a uh, grasp on what you understand from the last two sessions and that'll help me plan the next one. So I, I've never done that before mm -hmm. but I was explicit with them this time so that, and I used the term as, so that I as a teacher can understand what you understand and, and help, it'll help me plan for the next sessions. But we're not and, and, and like as teacher educators we're the one group at third level 
that we should be modelling the skills that we want those teachers to use, hopefully. <laughs> you don't want to be modelling the ones that you don't want them to use. Um, and uh, so, but it, yeah, it has to be explicit. Yeah. Not everyone will pick it up by osmosis. They yeah. just won't. No. Do you want to see a bit of video or would you like a cup of coffee? Would you like a cup of... We'll do a quickie. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> These, we're, we're just going to show you that they're literally the first one I think is only 45 seconds. We're going to start with the one, um, is that the two? Yeah. Okay. This is, the students are actually working on the tasks at this point. Um, That's actually the auditorium, so there were two wings at the side that you actually can't see. And yes, Mark, and, and they were working. Uh, yeah. They were engaged in the task. I mean, yeah. obviously, they weren't all engaged in the task all of the time, but they. It's the same when you're a lecturer. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. I like the noise. Yeah. yeah. If, it's, sure if there's noise. <laughs> I don't know if they could hear, but I like the noise. I hate the silence. Yeah. I hate asking a question in, in silence. This is going to be feedback. Some of you are in two targets, some of you are in one. Some of the questions I've been asked there have been really, really insightful. And um, just while Anna, maybe Anna, will you do the typing at the beginning? Yeah. And um, just a couple of questions. Like somebody, it just seems fairer or more attainable. You could always adapt your target if you find it oversold, if it's too easy or too difficult. But on the balance of probability, he probably needs to take it through that a little bit more slowly. Oh, and so, so you can think for a moment about those 100 McNally Murray words, he had 87 of those automatically at sight. So he has, he's maybe learning words by sight, by looking at them, and maybe sounds and vowels are going to be problematic for him. So it isn't that you're just going to work on those two vowels, you're going to be also building his sight vocabulary. I to just grab a couple of pages, Daniel, just throw them up to me. They'll all be mixed up. If I have about 10 of them, they'll all be stuck. The simple things like that made a difference. They knew they weren't there, one wasn't. And remember, Anne Marie talked you through the process of refining and improving learning targets. So we're not expecting a finished product. And we've also said repeatedly to you that this is a difficult task, made all the more difficult by the fact that you don't actually know this child. Okay? So, you know, we were attempting, and I know from walking around, lots of you were focusing on what you want the child to learn, which is the key thing we said. What do you want the child to be able to do? Anything else is icing on the cake. Tell them, Marie. Okay. I might start with a short one. <laughs> um, okay. John will learn the words. Because the and are, it was now. So I'm typing this so they can see it on the screen and you can't see yes, it. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah. You don't need to see that twice. There you go. Okay. Um, so look, we, we've gone over time. I suppose the, the, uh, the last the thing last line, was maybe. just to say what we learned. Yeah. Can we go to the last slide? Go to the one? last slide. Impact, impact on, on our, our practice. practice. Yeah. And we said some of these things already. Like yeah. Definitely, we, I know in Anne-Marie, Anne-Marie was the module coordinator and Anne-Marie was very clear about the need to model. But I think as we've done this, we've become more and more aware yeah. of this. And of other stuff that wasn't being targeted in this as well, and yeah. how we might improve in other aspects of what we do with these groups. We had ideas. We had a fair idea that these students were going to find this challenging. Um, and that was, again, one of the reasons why there was such an explicit link, more explicit than we might typically have used, between the format of what we were doing in class, what we were providing on loop, and how this was going to be assessed in the terminal examination. But I suppose the, the overarching thing was that 
you know, some of these students really blew our mind in terms of what brilliant. they could do. Yeah. I mean, some we, of the targets that were written were just excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Um, yeah. So highlighting that old chestnut of teacher expectations again. Yeah. <laughs> so. That they're well able. Yeah. Look, we'll break for coffee. We've enough pastries now to feed an army, and I'm in Weight Watchers, so I'm not having any. So uh, if you help, please do help yourselves on this fresh coffee there. We might take a wee little break. Um, the next session is Kahoot, so I'm going to set it up here, and at, when you're ready, just if you log on to... Um, you'll, see the, you'll see the prompt up here on the screen. You can log on. Help yourselves to Brecky first. <laughs>